Thank you, Karen, and to the whole uh, AIIHPC team for inviting us to this very uh, nice and useful day for us. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you all, and I'm happy that some of you are still resisting in this uh, long but fruitful day. Uh, this is just a draft of the slide, so I'll try to resonate on the contents that I heard already during the day and somehow that we discussed in the panel uh, a few seconds ago, so I'll try to, to uh, keep it short, also because Maria has a taxi waiting for her, so I promise to, to let her enough time to, to introduce her talk. Uh, first of all, uh, we mentioned academic industry uh, collaboration, but uh, 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 this is not probably the right way to look at the problem, so we don't have enough of just two colors. It's not just a matter of merging two colors into a brilliant, nice uh, result, uh, but uh, rather it's a more uh, complex uh, ecosystem we have to deal with. Uh, in this field, uh, we can make innovation only if we face this as a multi-stakeholder problem. And so, uh, of course, we need uh, the academia, of course, we need companies, but we also need other uh, players, like the public government uh, at the regional, national, and international, uh, so European levels, but also uh, key roles uh, is played by institutions such as your institute, uh, such as uh, uh, charities, uh, foundations, and even end-users organizations. They are really playing a crucial role uh, in order to ensure that uh, uh, what we can do in terms of technology transfer, what was called in the old times technology transfer and uh, innovation, can really make a, a difference to the life of real people. Uh, so it's basically what is now called open innovation. Uh, it's uh, a framework in which also, uh, for example, companies as have to engage in a, a new way of interacting with others. Of course, there are issues with IPR, there are issues with priorities, but still uh, it's really recognized that also to reflect the uh, pressure we have that Mary and others have uh, outlined before, we are uh, in a hurry. We, we need to speed up innovation because we really have uh, crucial uh, challenges that we need to face in a reasonable time. One of which is, of course, the aging of the population, which is dramatic at the global level, but also we have uh, an increased demand also in, pal in the palliative care field. So uh, this is a reason why uh, we need to speed up. And also, uh, in a way, we are in need of open innovation because we have tight budgets. All of us have tight budgets. Companies have tight budgets, the public have tight budgets, the academia, by definition, has a tight budget, at least in Italy. Uh, but still, uh, regardless of partners, uh, what I can say, and this can, in principle, also be a conclusion of my uh, talk, is that uh, we need to ensure success building on uh, three uh, basic principles, and Again, this is something which is not new. Uh, it's something that was mentioned also uh, before. First of all, we need a mutual interest. Uh, uh, so we need to identify common and achievable goals, but we also need to ensure a constant communication about expectations, timelines, uh, rewards, constraints, and changes in the plan. So uh, communication is crucial in this multi-stakeholder ecosystem, and finally, we need transparency and trust throughout any kind of projects that we can uh, build up here. So I will uh, not go uh, throughout the whole story uh, that uh, I had in mind to present you, but take this as a snapshot. Uh, I tried to focus uh, um, early enough in time to have a, a window of observation which allows to draw some conclusions, and so I focused on uh, what we were doing, and in one case also with Maria uh, in, the, in one of these projects, uh, let's say 10 to, to five years ago, more or less. Uh, at that time, we uh, uh, saw a, an amazing opportunity in pushing uh, the ideas, the solutions that we were developing in our labs towards the solution of uh, uh, real world problems 
uh, of real people in, in their life, in their daily life, in particular in the field of uh, ambient assisted living, ICT and aging, uh, personal health systems, uh, that found an interesting echo uh, in the calls, uh, uh, in particular in the seventh framework program by the European Commission. So what you see here is a snapshot of four projects, uh, three of which uh, I was the coordinator of at that time, and one of which I was a partner with Maria, which is smiling. And, and so I'll try to look at these as uh, uh, examples in order to, uh, as I told you, uh, keep some uh, lecture lessons uh, learned out of them, uh, in particular relating to the uh, partnerships that we had uh, uh, with companies, and not only with companies. Uh, the first one, uh, very briefly, but let's say it was a very seminal, seminal and exploratory project uh, trying to identify commonalities uh, and <laughs> Uh, challenges in taking technologies at home uh, to prevent falls, but to make also uh, life of people with Parkinson's disease uh, uh, easier uh, with uh, uh, the potential to uh, observe, so to monitor people at home, uh, to train them at home, so to provide contents for a, an empowerment, a patient empowerment at home, and also to include some remote linking with the clinical supervisors uh, from remote. Uh, uh, so it, more than 10 years ago, uh, this was the transactional project. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, we built up uh, uh, this consortium at that time, and we had a re relatively small company uh, in the partnership, which is Mac Roberts from uh, The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, it was really a family-owned company at that time, and uh, during the discussion and uh, the you know, cross-fertilization and brainstormings we had during this project, and following up with uh, the research uh, priorities that we identified in this project, we really uh, allowed them to grow up. And now they are one of the leading companies in the field of wearable sensors. They're involved in a number of epidemiological studies. They're working with pharma companies. They're really one of the world leaders in the production of wearable sensors. So of course, it was a mutual growth. Uh, still, it was very important to have uh, the opportunity to uh, face this challenge with them. Um, the Smiling Project, uh, where uh, Maria and myself were involved, was uh, indeed very challenging. Uh, uh, no, uh, I see that the video is not working, but that's okay. Okay, uh, uh, so there was a video to show you uh, which was the final achievement of the, this project, whose idea was again to, to take innovation uh, in the field of uh, uh, an aging population and to prevent falls uh, with uh, a very nice uh, idea, which is to introduce uh, chaos so to expose people to complex patterns and not uh, to simplify basically their uh, daily life, but to keep a controlled exposure to... to uh, so uh, the idea was to, to uh, design and prototype uh, uh, shoes which step by step were changing the uh, angle, the inclination uh, at the following step. So it's like walking on stones, but where you don't see at all where you're walking. So you, you will not know every step how your foot will hit the ground, basically. So that was a, a really amazing idea in, in principle, theoretically, that came from a, a basically a research team in Israel. Uh, and uh, so we worked really hard. It was a, a, a mess uh, to come up with the prototype. Unfortunately, you don't have the video, so you cannot see what we called in the end the Ferrari shoes both because they were red, red Ferrari, and also for the cost they had in the end. And I would say probably also for the weight, because they were really like heavy boots, you know, uh, that uh, had motors inside that were uh, changing the, the surface all the time. Uh, we also ran a small clinical uh, study out of it. Uh, in the end, what I, you can see here is something that maybe is now in, on the market. It's a maybe, because this is a, a different case. So we had a, a company which uh, actually, mm, with which I would say the trust probably didn't grow up uh, similarly well during the project, but 
they already had the patent basically, and this was not very clear from the beginning. Uh, uh, so uh, in the end, I don't know how much of the project actually turned into an improvement, uh, uh, but still, uh, apparently they are on the market and they have a prototype uh, or a system which is this type of shoe, which at least in part tries to implement this logic, which uh, I keep thinking is very smart, but I don't know, I don't see it, you know, after so many years as a success story. Probably, uh, you know, the, the possibilities which were behind this uh, uh, multinational uh, cooperation were not exploited fully uh, in this way. Uh, okay, um, very, very shortly, uh, Another example is this project in which also we had a number of, uh, I'm focusing here on small companies, I'm not mentioning at all the big companies, which we try always to have in the partnerships, and they're also very uh, you know, helpful to get a long-term view, to get easy access to uh, uh, innovative technologies. Here, for example, we had ST Microelectronics, which is number one provider in terms of uh, you know, electronic components, but uh, who really makes a difference in this ecosystem is to get engaged uh, with small and medium enterprises which sees, you know, a, a have a clear focused view on what they can do in terms of innovation. And in this case, uh, we had a company which was a microelectronics company that also followed us in the idea to provide home-based training for people with Parkinson's disease and so they designed for us uh, and with us uh, these wearable sensors that uh, they now have uh, on the market. They use also for different purposes. Uh, it's a very nice project indeed. Uh, uh, we also run a randomized control trial to prove that uh, a smartphone-based uh, solution uh, interacting with wearable sensors can relieve uh, people with Parkinson's disease from a cognitive overload and can help them uh, walk safer outdoor, so the idea was to let them train outdoor in the park uh, in a safe way, getting voice, so um, feedback during their walk in order to correct what was wrong in their motor behavior in real time. So the system is in real time monitoring the gate and is giving real time feedback in terms of uh, uh, corrective or uh, praising messages as well, which are important. Uh, I will not focus on other things, but I will just comment for a while on the right-hand part of this figure, because I always put it in my presentation. I think it's uh, really, really uh, uh, important, which is uh, an aspect that uh, uh, we always have to take into account, also in the field of palliative care, in particular in the field of palliative care, that uh, uh, this complexity, this need of having different uh, actors into the stage is related also to a paradigm shift that we all know we are experiencing, which is the move moving from a medical curative model to a social health perspective. So we are really in a world in which uh, the, the uh, health issues are dealt by very different uh, uh, players, not just uh, the, the hospital or the cl clinical specialist, and also geographically, it's more, much more interconnected. There are much more uh, layers, connections. Uh, some of them are virtual, some of them uh, are real. And so in this complex and fragmented framework, I think that uh, this uh, multidisciplinary cooperation and these technologies can really make a difference. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, this uh, uh, type of approach was acknowledged when it was published uh, by a nice editorial on the Parkinsonism and related disorders saying that this is the way and uh, some more work is done uh, in this direction. And also it's nice looked at a distance uh, in terms of uh, the, the success that uh, uh, it uh, uh, produced, this project produced, and the name of the project was Cupid. This was awarded a number of uh, awards uh, uh, by Wired, the MIT Technology Review, uh, who you see there is the former uh, prime minister in Italy and also the former uh, president of the European Commission, Romano Prodi from uh, Bologna, who was awarding this uh, uh, result, the, the type of system that we have uh, released in the project that now is a product. Uh, still, it's a product that uh, uh, is taken into the market by a startup company. So 
we didn't uh, really have a, a small medium enterprise which wanted to invest in this specific field. Uh, the microelectronic co uh, company uh, wanted to keep a broader market for their application and so uh, uh, still a tight cooperation with them and with other players and also the results of other projects such as Farseeing which dealt with fall risk assessment and uh, fall prediction which uh, we ran later uh, took uh, to the establishment of this startup company uh, as a uh, possible, you know, uh, further contribution to, uh, to the way in which uh, uh, different players can contribute, also in terms of generation of startup companies. And we've heard here today also of uh, uh, other examples like this, and that's crucial. And uh, uh, crucial also for the implications this may have in the field of palliative care is to work to really help people to, to, to live safer, in particular live safer at home. And indeed, uh, in this far-seeing project, uh, we demonstrated that uh, there's an acute need of new solutions for uh, uh, protecting from falls. Uh, we all know how frequent and negative is the experience of falling in the old age, but not only in the old age. And uh, uh, we showed how uh, technologies can be helpful in this uh, regard, also with some systematic contributions in terms of guidelines for technology delivery, taxonomy. Uh, really, we, we provided, we established a very general framework on which also others can build for making innovation in the field. And in the end, we proved that we very much need uh, to introduce uh, uh, technological components such as wearable sensors, in particular in daily life, to get knowledge of the habits, of the behavior of people. That it is the only way at the moment by means of which we can really try to do it better in terms of predicting faults. So to give a prognostic value to all that geriatricians are currently doing, which is uh, just a bit better than throwing a coin in terms of predicting the risk of future falling. And we showed and recently published that uh, we can do much, much better if we are able to observe, for example, by means of a smartphone, the physical behavior of people uh, during their daily life. In particular, that's curious, but how they turn into their daily life, the way in which they negotiate turns, in particular 90 degrees turns, is very uh, predictive. It's like a biomarker of future falling. Uh, but Let's go to a conclusion in order to leave the podium to Maria. Uh, then, uh, what's next? What did we do and what are we doing? We are uh, moving uh, forward in the direction, again, of taking this technology at home, which is, uh, I think, again, relevant for palliative care, in uh, smaller scale regional projects, in which a, a, a rich a regional uh, ecosystem is supporting us uh, and is really looking at academic industrial uh, cooperations, multi-stakeholder cooperation to release new products that can in a short time enter into the market. So you see an example here of a smart uh, chair that we are developing with a company to support, uh, to monitor people living at home. We are starting to design a smart park. So to have frail people also engage with physical activity outdoor uh, with a supervision, clinical supervision. And finally, uh, we are about to start a, a project with ANT that uh, some of you may know, uh, which is an important uh, palliative care uh, association in Italy dealing with uh, tumor patients. And we are exploiting virtual reality technology at home to improve the quality of life of cancer patients. Again, engaging also with companies for the different uh, aspects of the project. Uh, I will skip all of this, but as a final remark again, this is a complex field. We are in a hurry, but still we need a very favorable ecosystem. I see that in Ireland you have uh, most of this in place, and that's very important. And also we have a, a similar reality in our region, Emilia-Romagna, uh, and you really need all of this if you want to speed up. And also, as we said in the uh, table before, it's important that we have both a top-down and a bottom-up uh, push in this direction to uh, have uh, favorable results. Thank you. And